Good morning. Uh, sorry that I'm kind of giving my back to some of you. I'll try to push back a little bit. Uh, I'm Rodman Premack. I'm the Chief Creative Officer of Design Miami. And I'm so pleased to welcome everyone this morning for the first of our design talks. I'm very, very pleased um, to get everybody up and going early this morning. Uh, this has been a project that I have um, been really excited about for the fair this year, and it's a conversation I'm also really uh, interested in having with all of you. Um, we're going to be talking about art as an agent for change, and we're looking at a project that is up in the fair, uh, a wonderful uh, group of sculptures, chairs, swings, incredible uh, pieces called Endangered by Porky Heifer on the end, and I'm going to introduce to you well, Porky Heifer, the artist and designer from South Africa, at the end of the, of the lineup. Uh, our good friend Trevin McGowan, the founder and CEO of uh, the Guild Group from South Africa and um, founder of so Southern Guild Galleries. <laughs> My good friend Lisa Schiff in the middle, founder and CEO of um, Schiff, or president of Schiff Fine Art, and um, <laughs> Terry, Terry Tamanen, who's the CEO of the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. Um, and please welcome them all to the, the stage. I think before we jump into anything, I wanted to show this short, this incredible short that um, we had prepared, you guys prepared. I'm trying to move it forward and it's not doing it. If Thank we you. do nothing, the picture of the world is one of absolute devastation. Super storms all the time, heat waves. Melting glaciers. Species extinction. Poverty and illness. People are gonna say, I can't live here. A world that is warmer has more war. All of this can seem incredibly overwhelming, but the truth is, the only way not to feel hopeless is simply to take action. At LDF, we support organizations who do exactly that. To date, we've given over $80 million to more than 200 projects around the world. Projects that build climate resiliency, protect vulnerable wildlife, and restore balance to threatened ecosystems. The time for all of us to act is now. Please join us. There's a lot in that, uh, and I think it's a great starting point for us to talk about the importance of the work that the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation is doing. And Terry, I'd really love it if we could hear from you a little bit more about what the foundation's doing what your goals and projects are, and, and you know, give us a little bit more of a scope of, of what's happening. There's also, I think you have a few slides, and hopefully this will work um, to move them forward, or I can move them forward for you. But. All right, I, I think some of them are just beauty shots, but uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much to you and your whole Design Miami team for hosting this and for hosting us uh, in Miami <laughs> last December real visionaries in bringing together art and the environment and, and uh, helping to inspire new generations and, and new ways of thinking. And of course, I want to compliment everyone on the stage here, especially our amazing artists who we're going to hear from <laughs> shortly. And, uh, and Jill Madison, who's in the back there, who is my colleague at uh, the DiCaprio Foundation, who helped us put all this together as well. Woo! Yes. <clears throat> So, uh, it, and for those of you that would like a little bit more information about the foundation, we have some brochures like this that are, I think, on the stage there. You can grab one on the way out if you want to read in the old-fashioned way. <laughs> but amazingly, the DiCaprio Foundation is celebrating its 20th year. Leo started it uh, 20 years ago when he made a little film you probably never heard of called Titanic, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> took some money from that and started the foundation to work on endangered species that he cared about and their habitats, and as you saw even in the brief video, uh, giving an indigenous people the ability to protect those habitats and those lands. And then uh, as much progress as was actually being made, and we can talk about how uh, our elephant crisis fund has actually started to increase the, the birth rate of elephants in places like Kenya and, 
and uh, our, some of our other funds, which I'll just talk briefly about, are, are actually making a measurable difference. But in uh, the last few years, Leo came to realize when he was making a documentary called Before the Flood about climate change impacts, he came to realize that much or all of that progress could be undone by climate change. So if we don't get that one thing right, all the rest won't matter. And that's really, I think, what motivates LDF today and looking forward and, and the reason that we need these new voices and new ways to inspire people and to think differently because of this sense of urgency, that we have maybe <clears throat> three to five years to peak our global emissions of greenhouse gases, and then we need to start bringing them down dramatically thereafter. Uh, we, we, again, as I mentioned, so many things that could be undone. And just to give you a very brief story, uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was part of a team that rescued a baby gray whale in the Pacific Ocean near Los Angeles. And it was trucked to SeaWorld in San Diego, and it was nursed back to health over a period of a year and released back into the wild. And hundreds of people that participated in saving this helpless creature, we all patted ourselves on the back that we had saved this animal from, from death. And, uh, and, and after several months, it was actually seen living in the, in the natural environment again and thriving. So we have a good belief that she would live to be her natural 70 or 75 years of age, except for climate change. The truth is that whale, which SeaWorld named JJ, JJ will probably die of starvation by the time she hits 50 years of age because ocean acidification, the excess greenhouse gases that are being absorbed by the ocean are literally changing the chemistry of the ocean and making it more acidic. And that prevents the tiny shrimp-like creatures that whales like JJ eat uh, from forming. And slowly, it's wiping out the food source in the Arctic. And as a result, she literally, and her generation, will probably be the last generation of gray whales to survive on this planet, even though we have brought them back from the brink of extinction and that particular whale we saved. So that's why we have this sense of urgency about what we do, that even the progress we're making could so easily be undone if we don't take dramatic action now. And the only way that dramatic action is going to happen, other than changing the President of the United States, <coughs> um, <laughs> quickly, um, is, uh, is, yeah, please, <laughs> is, is to get everyone involved. Well, how do you reach people? It can't just be preaching. It can't just be wagging a finger and saying, oh, you're bad because you drive an SUV or whatever it is. We have to inspire people to make change. We have to educate them. And what better way than through art? And that's why we're so excited to be partnering with uh, Southern Guild, with Porky, with uh, Schiff Fine Arts, and everybody here today. So I can go into much more detail about how we do what we do with our various uh, uh, funds, and you'll see some pictures we can click through here. But, but rather than give a lecture on, on the environment, I think uh, we can, we can uh, hear from others first. Well, you, I think it's actually a perfect segue um, to speak to Lisa a little bit, because Lisa's kind of the center, center meeting point of um, LDF and Design Miami and, and Porky and, and Trevin. You know, Lisa, you've been working with the foundation for, for a number of years, and you've been going on this adventure with, with Leo for fundraising and trying to think about how art and our community, um, the design community, our community, can support this vision of, of conserving animals and also really, um, you know, making strides in understanding how important it is to um, preserve the environment. How did this specific idea come about, and what's the kind of like genesis of this whole thing? Because you know, you and I have spoken about it a lot for the last couple of years, but tell us a little bit about how we got here today, from your perspective, and sort of like how this became important to you. Um, well, is this on? Oh yeah. Hi. So um, I really, I mean, I was worried about climate change and thought about environmentalism and think I'm a good person and all that sort of stuff, and I was hired by Leo as his personal art advisor. And then one day he said, oh, by the way, come to San Tropez because we have this gala for my foundation, and I had no idea what it was. So I went to the first auction, and I was like, oh, this is kind of amazing. And so over, it's been four years now, 
um, and Terry came in about two years ago, I've learned a lot um, that I didn't know at all. Actually, a lot of terrifying things, but really interesting things. And I started to realize about myself, you know, what I wasn't doing or that I wasn't participating or thinking about any of this stuff. And I also was looking at, wow, we're raising a lot of money with art, but we're not really using it for what it could be best at here. Because when I went around to work on the auctions, I would go meet with people to get them to buy tables or donate art or maybe sponsor. And I could tell they had no idea what the foundation was about, that they were bored at the mention of uh, climate change, and that they really just wanted to take a selfie with Leo, which is understandable because he's very handsome. Um, so I thought, you know, it's, it's scary. It's really scary. So people kind of don't want to talk about it, or it's a little bit boring. It's also overwhelming because there are so many things that have to come together for it to get fixed that people are just like, screw it, you know, we're just, I'll just go on with my day because I can't do anything. And then I, I realized art is a really nice way in to topics that are uncomfortable. So we could work with artists in a more productive way and get them to kind of tell stories here and there. And also, I think one of the more interesting thing is beyond telling the story are materials. Because, you know, it's like, all right, I don't use as many plastic bottles. I still, on occasion, use one. Sorry. <laughs> but I try not to, right? And probably everybody in the room, like, at least you're thinking about it. Even if you're still doing it, you're like, shit, I shouldn't do this. But there's so many things that we don't know. Like, my mom told me the reason I had 13 fillings when I was seven years old is because the side of the high C uh, bottle said real fruit. But, you know, there, was no there were no labels, and there's no labels on anything that, you know, where, where is this from? How much child labor was used for this? How much, you know, what's the carbon impact of my dress? There's nothing to tell me that, and there's nothing to tell me on a piece of furniture. I didn't know until a few days ago, and I'm sorry if everybody else knew this and I'm stupid, that polyurethane is in pretty much all of my furniture, and it's basically just fossil fuels. So just learning about this, and if we can get artists to think about it and, and start thinking about it and, and also change, if everyone just somehow is thinking, like, all right, maybe I can buy a secondhand leather pair of shoes instead of you know, buying more and more. Um, and so that was really the impetus. That and the fact that every time I go to the design fair, which we love because of Rodman, there's always one, or at least over the past few years, I keep seeing these hanging pods nests, like these nests, and I'm just like, God, I really want to get in there. It's like, it's like the womb. So I just sort of became obsessed with them, and there was, an, was it an orca? It was a kid, yeah. yeah. It was an orca in Miami this year, and I was like, that's cool. I'm like, I wonder if, he, it was leather, right? It was leather. And I was like, that is so cool. I wonder if he would ever do endangered species for us. And so I introduced myself to Trevin, who was so nice and like, sure, I'll take the idea to the artist. And then, you know, went away for the holidays, kind of forgot about it. And I get this email with a proposal and these amazing sketches. And, um, and, and so uh, thank you for not disregarding my request. And thank you for also not disregarding it. And, and here we are. Uh, I think that's sort of like a, a perfect way to actually jump into uh, speaking to Porky. Uh, I'm kind of going through some of your images, but uh, before we even do that, Porky, I've got to address it because my Instagram has like been asking me all day, tell us just about the name, <laughs> Porky Heifer. Um, well, the backside is right. Um, Heifer was, was a, is, a, is my real surname. Um, I had a bit of a nightmare brother who was two years ahead of me in everything. Um, and he sort of worked out bullying and name calling and stuff. So he called me every fat name in the book. Okay. I mean, our set work for the year, unfortunately, was three men in a boat. So I picked that one up. I had every nickname of a fat person possible. I was large-ish, but um, I don't know why they just picked on me for that. But um, he then Porky settled. So it was Porky Heifer. I didn't actually understand the animal theme that goes on. So it's actually just my brother, but I've managed to, from something that was 
so negative. I mean, honestly, mm. it was like a typical police situation where like, I'd go home and cry and say, how can I be fat and stuff like my mom would pat me and stuff. But from something that was so bad and caused me so much pain, it's actually the biggest asset that I have at the moment. And especially, I mean, it was almost, it was almost my destiny to get into animals and natu nature because, I mean, porky heifer, it's like, what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> animals? <laughs> and then that's why my first company that I opened was called Animal Farm. So, and that was just about bringing back the, the animal and getting rid of the human, getting back into instinct rather than into social norms and trying to think of why you're doing something, just do it because that's why you're here. Excellent. I think we have a video that is, um, tells us a little bit about the project. Is this the right spot for it? <laughs> One of the things that I'd really like to know is how many people were involved with this project in your studio or within um, your community? I think I worked with about 100 people in all, maybe even more than that. Um, the way that I work is I don't have a studio myself. Here's my studio and my car's my studio. Mm -hmm. um, I work with systems that already exist rather than me setting up another system and trying to invest in it and get enough equipment and get enough expertise to become a front runner. What I do is I look for existing systems that are maybe needing a boost um, to get them back into a bit of relevance. So I worked with three people that I've been watching for many years. Um, I spend a lot of the time just meeting people, understanding techniques, understanding what they can do, what their methods are and everything, and then I subvert them. And I, I bring them into relevance. So all of these, the, the three groups, one was Heartworks, which is this, they do these amazing teddy bears um, that they embroider with these amazing embellishments and, and handwork. The teddy bears are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to try and compete in an international market with all the stuff coming from China and everywhere else. So, I mean, my thing is, I mean, like with the Blind Society, we don't have to be working on trying to be cheaper and cheaper. You've got to set a standard and set a standard for yourselves and start going for museums and start putting, because this handwork is something which I believe the one thing that we've got to also look after is, as well as animals, is people and traditions and techniques of these old traditions that people have been using for years and years and years, for thousands of years, without any, any, any impact on our climate. So people in the beginning, more indigenous and, and native people, were looking at systems and understanding them a lot more to make them sustainable. So if you stop seeing like a tuna, stop fishing tuna because you're not going to be able to eat tuna. And they move around like an island, they'll fish on other sides of the island. So working with different groups, the one being Margaret with the embellishment, the other one was Millie 
which was an interesting thing. My, my next door neighbor was one of our greatest sopranos ever in South Africa. We used to live with her singing every day, and it was just amazing. But she'd come across the road and go, you have to work with my daughter. She's very talented. <laughs> And I was like, oh, okay, that's the, the old lady always says that about their daughter. Her daughter turned out to be Millie, which is the lady who did the sloth and the, and the whale. Um, their technique using old um, textiles, cuts off, off cuts from the, the T-shirts that get cut. And um, they, they just turn that. These ladies all work in Kailicha. Um, it's about the textile industry is the third worst polluting industry on earth. First being mining, second agriculture, and then the third, textiles. The biggest problem being the amount of dyes that we use. Gap is a major, major cause of the amount of dyes that go into denims that cannot be eradicated. They just land up in the waters. So I love that thing about, and that's what Lisa was saying, like, I'm sitting here in all these clothes which are actually destructive. Clothing, we've got to dress ourselves at least once a day, maybe twice a day. Food is three, that's agriculture's higher. Um, fossil fuels being more because you're driving and you're powering everything, but clothing is a very big thing. So I love the way that it was highlighting the fact that the textile industry is not all that good, and you start looking at yourself, am I in fashion? You know? um, and then the other group was Renal Yodan. Renal Yodan's been amazing with her work in felt. She's done that, she did those stones. She was the original felt rock lady. Um, and I mean, I think the one thing as a designer, we always see these techniques and people and things, and you want to work with them very quickly. And what I did with Renelle, she's very good, and she's, a, she's, she's one of our first proper designers in South Africa, I would say, making an international name. Um, you've got to have the right project. And this was the right project, to go to people, these huge groups of people, and to somehow bring them together in three disparate places, four disparate, five disparate places, everything all over. But the one common goal of working towards animals was amazing. Everyone was so tired. I mean, me sleeping there is like, honest. I mean, we were, we were exhausted. We had to do this in double time. But whenever anyone got tired, they would think of the job that they were doing. And they would just, and that's why I like that movie, because it, it just keeps on going and going and going. Forky, did you have a feeling, and were you as clear about the importance of working in this fashion before you started this project, or did this project help you connect with the with that? You know, with really I mean, thinking I think about the materiality and, the and right how it was time. coming. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean um, in the very beginning, I worked with a lot of um, natural, natural, organic products. Um, the cane um, that also is a bit of a problem because it gets shipped all over the world. I work with the Blind Society, and the reason why they have the cane in the first place is because the blind can work with, with basketry. Um, then I went on to leather, and there was a strange thing. Working on leather, I spent a lot of time in the leather factory, and I got allergic to sheepskin mm. just from working in this factory and started thinking about that and started thinking about the materiality. But, I mean, a lot of my situations in South Africa is a bit different to sort of Europe and, and America, where you are developing new and new technologies and new and new materials which are becoming more and more eco-friendly. In South Africa, we don't have that ability. I mean, I think the brief at the beginning was mushroom leather and pineapple leather. And I tried to contact a couple of guys in South Africa and talk about pineapple leather, and they were like, what are you talking about? Mm. So that was interesting in that, that the brief was actually about modern technology and where we are today, but we don't have that in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So I had to almost go back in time to the time when people were working in traditions, hand traditions, which they weren't causing damage. And that started me, I mean, my life will be different now because my materiality definitely has changed. And you just realize how much waste products there are mm -hmm. that can be used to give a second life. The one problem, I mean, if you do use a plastic to recycle it, then the plastic guys go, we've got an amazing product. It has this life and it has another life. So the plastics you should sort of steer clear of because we've got to kill plastics completely. An amazing fact about plastics, more than half the plastics on Earth at the moment were produced in the last 15 years. So we're accelerating so radically mm -hmm. fast that we have to understand that. Um, another one, the, it was a billiard ball company in New York, and the problem was that billiard balls were all from ivory. So, so were combs and piano mm -hmm. keys were all from ivory. 
So the guys were like, we can't do this. We're destroying the animals. We're destroying the earth with our billiard ball. So they sent out this competition. Who can design a billiard ball that behaves and has the same properties as an ivory billiard ball? Mm -hmm. And cellulose was discovered. So plastic was invented to save the animal, which is quite bizarre. But we just took it and we understood the durability of this thing and the ease of it, and then just went mad. We went too far. We went too far, yeah. And do you think that this will Im continue to impact your, your practice going forward? Um, the thing that I like to do, I, th I find art, most art, exclusive and not inclusive. And there's a lot of secrets in art, like oh, it's a story about this, or it's a technique, or it's something that a lot of people can't, can't interact with or sort of reach straight away. A lot of people go, well, I don't understand that. I try to be a lowest common denominator, where I bring people in. Mm -hmm. And just from yesterday's show, to see some of those people who were so stuck up to turn around <laughs> and start giggling and jumping on a polar bear and wrapping themselves in and saying, selfie, selfie. And, I mean, it's so easy to do the fear factor. Mm. Um, but the fear factor didn't work. And it doesn't work because, as Lisa said, it puts you back in your shell. Um, it's got to be something which excites you and really affects you and inspires you. And judging on yesterday, it'll be a lot more of that, yes. I think that's amazing. Um, just quickly, I want to make sure that everyone actually sees that these are the pieces that, that you produced for um, Endangered, the sloth, the whale. They all got female names. Um, and Tell us. I think it's very, there's Trevin, Trev, Trevin. Um, uh, the whale is Wendy, which is my mother, Wendy. Um, my late mother. And that's Kwishiktok, which is the Inuit Indian name for, for woman. Um, and it, actually the translation means wet. So the polar bear, because it's, it's losing its ice, mm -hmm. it's having to swim a lot more and it's getting wet. So that's just a, it's, I didn't know Kwishiktok. Um, and this is Yalda, this is my wife. You know, uh, tell us one more story, and then, of and course, that's Sandy. Sandy. Um, the reason why, I mean, Lisa picked it up in the beginning. There were, I, I'm a tree dweller. I'm up in the, in the trees and suspended off ground and stuff. I love the feeling of suspension. And just what happened in the development of these, these round spheres that you get inside, and you lack the control of understanding where you are on Earth, it's very womb-like. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they all could, I mean, I'm now on Z. I've done women from A to Z now. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that women are far more nurturing and far more sort of helpful and as opposed to men, which are a lot more egotistical and they kill things. So I believe that it is the mother that will bring the nurturing and that's what people have to get back into, this feeling. <laughs> so much there. <laughs> And you know what, I'm going to skip, we'll come back to this, because I think it's actually a really great moment to speak again to you, Terry, to tell us actually, if you can, a little bit about the conservation state of some of these animals that you know, are in the project. Sure, well, um, you know, every one of them is threatened either directly or indirectly through their habitat, so sloths, orangutans, uh, largely are, uh, every time you eat baked goods or Oreo cookies, which might not be so popular here, but they are in the United States, uh, you're eating palm oil. And that's, of course, what is causing massive deforestation uh, of these regions and uh, destruction of these animals. Uh, and that's really kind of the theme for almost all extinction. Uh, the billiard balls was a good example. It was just some kind of a product. Nobody wanted the, the elephant. No one was eating its meat. It was, uh, it was for the tusks. And, uh, uh, and so many species are endangered as a result of that. Things like shark finning, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard about that. Uh, the, the Chinese um, obsession with shark, mm -hmm. shark fin soup and that kind of thing. And you see these terrible uh, uh, photographs and videos of uh, capturing sharks, cutting off the fin and throwing the rest of the animal away. I mean, it's one thing if we're consuming it, nurturing our, our own bodies with, with it. It's a very different thing to just use it in, in such an abusive way. Uh, so every one of these species is, is critically endangered, perhaps not technically, they might not yet be on an endangered species list, but as I mentioned with the example of the Pacific gray whale, where we think everything is fine, it's heading for a cliff. Mm -hmm. 
A hundred percent, Lisa. You're... I just wanted to say one more thing that I was thinking of when both of you were just talking. Um, I have a five-year-old son, and when he got old enough to watch cartoons, I realized every cartoon is about animals. You know, it's more about animal characters than human characters. And then I realized, shit, my only interaction with animals is actually through cartoons and not actual, I mean, I have dogs, but we don't really interact unless it's the zoo or safari, which is kind of like a zoo. And watching his sense of empathy learning through animals is really amazing. And yesterday, watching people interact with these animals and the joy and kind of this childlike feeling of happiness that came over people, uh, the whole point of this is to make change, little bits of change in, in every one of us. But I was really nicer to people yesterday. I talked to two people I hate. I even sold one, one of the, one of the works. So I'm just saying it's working. <laughs> The magic of animals. Uh, Trevin, I also want to speak a little bit. Um, we missed that a good image of, of a shark but and another shark. I wanted to speak to you a little bit about um, the Guild and Southern Guild because I, I think your program and yours and Julian's vision for what you guys can do with design and art in South Africa is so amazing and important and is also sort of the seed to all of this. You know that before this happened, you guys made this incredible commitment to your community and um, the people in your community. And I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about you know, the history of the gallery and you know, how you guys decided that you were gonna do this and how you felt you could use the power to really help people. Well, we'd been living overseas for about 20 years. I'm from South Africa originally, and so Julian and I were immersed in the design industries in different ways. Um, and uh, coming back, we realized to South Africa about 15 years ago, we were really struck by the originality of the voices and the fact that the work that was being done and the, and the, the, the kind of interest that the people have um, in the design, in, well, there wasn't even a design industry, really. There were just extraordinary talents uh, at that time. Um, and so we wanted to really communicate to the rest of the world what that vision was and, and to encourage and propel and kind of really almost demand a, a level of excellence and most importantly a level of community because um, everybody had been quite isolated before and the first show we did we got 30 designers together for Southern Guild this is 10 years ago and most of them had never even met each other before and through this coming together there was a sense of um, not competition really, but a sense of a movement, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate to have some support from the South African government to, through applying for it, to, to bring them to shows, that uh, groups of designers to shows like Design Miami, mm -hmm. um, in Miami and, and in Basel, and for them to look at the rest of the work that was being done by the rest of the world, and to understand that it was very important not to be emulating it and to have some sort of perceived idea of what design should be or could be, what they, they should be doing, but more importantly, to really harness what their own voice was and how to stay distinct and unique and original. And I think that that's the thing we're probably most committed to is really preserving this other kind of conversation. And it's very much about the hand and it's about the designer maker and it's about individual viewpoints um, and then the sense of, of togetherness and what that means as a cohesive narrative. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how we work. And how have you found um, the, you know, the design market to be responsive? I mean, I kind of know, but I want you to tell us a little bit about how the last couple of years have, have been going in terms of, of well, the market for this work. Yeah, I mean, when we first applied in 2000 and 10, or I think it was, to come to Design Miami, um, we were rejected, and we was, and, and, and the, the answer was we, that we just don't understand the, the, the program, we don't understand, and, I, and, and maybe at that time it was too crazy, but I think that it's, we're getting into the stride where people are understanding, but because it is quite different, it's taken a little bit of time, but there is a, a real interest mounting and a real understanding of the, of the program and of the work. And I think, you know, that's, Porky has always been a, a real leader in the, in the work that we show. And I think what people are 
understanding from his work is that, or experiencing rather, because actually it's less about understanding with Porky than it is about just feeling. Mm -hmm. And you can look at a piece of work and think that it's extraordinary and um, understand the context or the historical relevance, or and you can uh, kind of engage in it in a, in a passionate way. But what happens when you interact with a Porky piece is that you're, it's actually transformative. You go in in one state of mind and you're held, you're cosseted, you're back in the womb, you're remembering when you were a child, you're thinking about your humor is evoked, you're, and all of these different emotions and feelings are running through you and you step away from the work changed. And so people are, there's an emotional connection rather than an intellectual connection, most pointedly with, with Porky, but also with, with a lot of the other designers. I've always thought it was amazing that, and some of you guys may know this, but you also, you know, you guys created a fair, you created like your own platform to bring designers and to bring talent to South Africa, to connect with craftspeople there, to create a dialogue, both to preserve what you were, you know, both to preserve what you were doing in South Africa, but also I think to open up the craft to other people to come. You know, there's a slide up right now um, with the Haas brothers, you know, who are friends of all of ours and, and also exhibiting at the fair. Uh, through, and very good friends with Leo <laughs> as well, um, but through you guys and, and through Zesty and Evan, they you know, did this incredible project in South Africa. Tell us a little bit about that, and I think that was like, for me, a really like, watershed moment for you guys as a gallery, and also for us to understand really how we can, can use Design Miami to do good things. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think that we're so far away and we're so isolated, and for a very long time we were, you know, sanctioned uh, for a very good reason. But it, it meant that um, South Africans do feel very far away, and I think that the only way we can be, um, you know, understood or, 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 or globalized really is through collaboration mm -hmm. and through authentic connection. And Design Miami has definitely been that for us. It feels like family when we come and we feel, you know, the connections and, and our own company and Zesty and Evan were incredibly important to us right from the outset of, of advising and mentoring mm -hmm. and sharing. And even last night we were sitting and getting advice and um, we, we did, it was World Design Capital in South Africa in 2014 and we'd done such big exhibitions before we'd done work with you know, 100 designers and opening the, um, the Museum of, of uh, Design in Johannesburg. And we needed to do something we'd never done before on a scale we'd never done before. So we did a fair called Guild, mm -hmm. and our and company participated, Carpenters Workshop, Rosano Landi, Carwan, people mm -hmm. from all over the, the world. So it was sort of representing South America and Europe. And, and through that, we did a program where we introduced a lot of the designers and galleries to the makers and studios and manufacturers through this sense of collaboration again and through sharing and community. And really, that has evolved into a long-term relationship of ongoing manufacture for a variety of different studios and, and, and artists. And it teaches our... Um, our artists, but it also um, makes them feel more relevant. And I think that's also the most important part of what we do is that we are increasing confidence. So mm. the monkey biz beaders, those those um, women who used to make a little piece, bring it in, sell that piece, go away, make it. They have had years of employment. They've been, you know, they've visited the the um, Cooper Hewitt in New York to see a huge exhibition of their work. They've met Beyonce. They've gone back, mm. and within their communities, they are now rock stars. Mm. And from a very humble sort of piecemeal craft perception, working for an HIV supporting program, they're now thinking of themselves as global designers. And I think that that is critical to making people do extraordinary work and breaking mm -hmm. the barriers. And do you think that, uh, that doing this project will also affect you guys as a gallery thinking about sustainability yes. and materiality in a similar way that, you know, sort of, I don't know, like a light switch happens for each of us? Do you think that, that this experience is, has changed the way that, that you'll approach projects with your other with your other artists and other designers absolutely I mean I think that because everything is made by hand and and the, and the the work is about long-term investment not throw away um, commodity we have felt like you know this is really good but this has given a much deeper understanding and a much kind of more and, and I think for everybody even the women who've been working in recycled materials mm -hmm. haven't really understood the impact and being part of this project has changed their viewpoint too. It's amazing. Yes, Lisa. Um, one thing I, I don't know if everybody here realizes but 
oftentimes the art world, not so much the design world, can be really exclusive and shut off. And it's interesting that our project coincides with the a movement of the project, art project across the street, moving upstairs and the bridge opening for mm -hmm. the first time. So there's this crossover. And something else that's happening in the art world is, is it, there's like a consumption of experience. And so this project actually, it's functional design, but it's also, your, it's, it's sort of like part of a new wave of, of art. So um, I hope that, sorry, Mark Spiegler, art puzzle. <laughs> um, I sort think of he's busy this morning. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, becomes as, as open-minded as, as uh, design. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I wanted to actually go back to something um, Porky with you because I remembered the story that you told us last night about an orangutan or about specifically this incredible creature just because I love the story and I like how personal she is to you. Um, you were telling us about being a kid and looking at New Yorker magazines. Will you tell us a little bit about... So when I was six, um, we were really isolated from the world. My father worked in the dip diploma diplomatic corps, so he went to the States, he fell in love with the New Yorker magazine, and he used to bring that back. In the beginning of, well, throughout the New Yorker magazine, on the sides there's those little strips of the strip ads mm -hmm. to fill up the column spaces. And there was this tiny little, literally like a big postage stamp of this gund orangutan. And it was a six foot orangutan and I was like, well, that's the coolest thing possible. That my toy is bigger than me and I'm its baby and I just thought that was great. So I said to my dad, will you please get me this on your next trip to New York? So he was like, no. <laughs> Price and size, no. So um, finally, I've got my orangutan and it's in the same proportions as I was to it when I was small. So I got my orangutan. And it's probably a lot more sustainable than uh, a gund. Than that one. I wanted to come back to that because I, I, I wanted to remind everybody there's so much seriousness in what we're speaking about, but there's also so much humor and so much love in this project and kind of joy and, you know, pleasure. And I, I, I wanted to, to remind us about that. And I also want to ask you guys, particularly Lisa, and we'll get to questions as well and sort of let people ask some things from the audience, but what does success look like for you and for the foundation? Like, what does it look like for you as, as putting, for putting this all together? Money, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, partially money. Um, I think success is already happening. I mean, just watching people yesterday interact, whether they buy something or not, I think, I think a lot of people took the postcards, actually know that we were doing something different. I mean, I don't know how else to, to impart, you know, that. This is what the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation does, and here we are in the art world. Um, so I think we're already successful. I have no doubt these will sell. We are, um, we are not, it's not a donation. It's not all for the foundation, and we're actually paying an artist <laughs> to do something as well. I mean, who, yes, but who's also, there's, there's some donation there too. I mean, there's a lot more here. So. Um, I think success is also, you know, the art world is the very privileged, like 0.999% of people. And, you know, we are probably the ones causing most of the problems for the disenfranchised. So if we can, you know, and not in a malicious way, I think a lot of people have no idea. Yeah. Um, so to kind of help educate them in a nice way, um, not make people feel shitty about themselves, but just like, okay, let's start. Let's start right here. And Terry, what does it look like for you? Well, I, I'd say two things. One is, yes, as a foundation, we raise money and then give it to NGOs, uh, and our own team crafts a lot of the solutions. For example, our, our shark conservation fund, which there's a slide somewhere, you don't have to necessarily try to find it, but uh, actually works with uh, dozens of NGOs around the world, identifying the best solutions for conserving these apex predators, without which there wouldn't be a lot of the ecosystems that we see in the ocean. And, uh, and we're now discovering through some of those grants and research that uh, there's certainly areas where the animals breed, uh, where they collect, that you want to try to preserve, just, uh, just like on land, where we set aside parks and, 
and protected areas. But in the ocean, sometimes it's more important to just preserve the areas that they transverse, where they connect some of those ecosystems. And now with modern science, you can actually tell because when they're swimming through the water, they're sloughing off skin and so forth. Mm -hmm. DNA samples can tell you how they get from A to B. Amazing. And so it's those kinds of grants that can then unlock enormous conservation gains. Mm -hmm. so, so we want to, number one, be able to measure our results in terms of actual conservation gains. Five years of our Elephant Crisis Fund, for example, now last year was the first year in decades that the birth rate of elephants in Kenya exceeded the death rate. And it's, ex it's directly related to the 200 grants and the specific programs that this Elephant Crisis Fund, which is not just us, it's 15 other funders and, and a lot of NGOs working very hard at the grassroots level on the, the poaching of elephants, the trafficking of ivory, and then the demand side in China but you can actually measure the results and see the tide turning. And I'd say the second thing is seeing the tide turning, and this is maybe even more relevant to the art world, in terms of public perception and understanding, mm -hmm. especially in this day and age when you can have political leaders who deny science, basic mm -hmm. science. Uh, it's absolutely critical to inspire people and get them to ask the questions and demand better. And with modern, uh, technology through, uh, through the internet and, and uh, the way that we track people for better or for worse, mm -hmm. you can actually tell when public opinion is changing. So we want to be able to measure that as well. And that's one of the real goals, I think, of, <clears throat> for all of you guys, is, is using this as, as a way to connect with the public and right. a broader public and a broader public. Environmentalists are cool. Okay, <laughs> we're really cool. <laughs> I think uh, we should open up the floor to, conver to conversation, to questions, if there are any questions or ideas that, that the audience wants to pose to any, anybody up here. Natalie. I can hear you, but maybe. Shy. But um, anyway, the Kratz brothers, if you have kids and you want to teach them about how to save the planet, that's a TV show that was designed to help children fall in love with animals and discover their creaturality in order to save the planet. If you want to save the creatures, you will inevitably save the planet. It's a really great show where they went to 50 countries around the world that I worked on in the uh, late 90s. And they went to look at extinct animals and animals and get to know them. and sort of roll around with elephants in the mud or go hang out with sloths. And it's, it's a great way. I think the future is children, obviously, that the next generation. I'm from Canada where we've been sort of blue boxing our garbage for the last 30 years. It's considered a national crime if you put plastic with paper. So um, <laughs> it's great that you're bringing this forward. But my question was about the sharks. You've been making these sharks for a while. Was that because of the endangered sharks? No, the first was the killer whale. Um, the killer whale was actually, the killer whale I thought of when I was coming to Miami and I understood that, and it was at the point when SeaWorld was getting in trouble for the killer whales and they had to stop. So that was Fiona, and Fiona was, that was setting Fiona free. So basically, that was them getting out. So you bought it and took it out and took it out of it. It was just a free willy, but that was the, <laughs> my connection with the, with the shark. So, I mean, I'm not very big in the water, but I, I love them. The sharks, this one is just, just from just watching movies and seeing the problems that are erupting. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I have more questions, sorry. Um, the materials that you sourced to make these, this project, yeah. how were you able to measure the impact of, of the materials to produce them, or were they recycled, or how did you, you know, quite well, often? Well, that was the brief. That was the initial brief, was for me to use recycled or eco-friendly products. So 
Like even the stuffing inside is, a, is plastics that has been broken up and recycled and creating, plas uh, creating the stuffing as opposed to me creating new stuffing. And uh, so it's totally recycled plastic. So we got into all these, and that was only found because we had to investigate. And that will become a bigger and bigger thing because it's actually a very good stuffing. I mean, again, I don't want to create the need for the plastic to come in the first place, but it's a good way. I mean, all the plastics need to be recycled as opposed to being reproduced. You know what I mean? We need to stop producing plastics and then start recycling all the ones that we have. Um, the other thing in the, in, the, in the sloth and the whale, that's all offcuts from textile industry. Um, and then the other one is, is a cotton that we've worked with the ladies and, and we've just found, we found an eco-friendly cotton material and then everything else is hand. There's no machinery there. The difficulty for me is if Lisa has success and we all have success here, I've got to go back and make animals. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't work with a computer at all. Um, in most situations, I think a designer, I'm very techno. Um, in most cases, a designer, no technology. <laughs> Um, in most cases, a designer would just have a, a file which they would push, print. But all of those things that you, you see me in my workshop in the first place is that I don't have a single drawing or a single any information when I have to make the other one. I have to go back in and we can't really think about it too much because then we'll start going wrong. So what me and my, my friend Wellington, we do this deal together. We just let go and let our, our memory take over. So with the three killer whales, I mean, they're almost identical, and there's not a single CAD file or machine used to bend a piece of material or anything. Everything is just literally made by my hands to start with. And, and one of those whales is in the National Gallery of Victoria, so it was Porky's first museum acquisition, and he's going to do a very big project with them for their 2020 show. Um, I also wanted to say, sorry, on that note of materiality, um, of materiality, when we were you know, just starting to think about this, you realize there's no standard, at least that I know of, that, to really measure mm. materials. Like there's no stamp that I could say, this, is, this gets the FDA you know, approval of here's what's in your milk. And so you know, I hope that helps. I'm assuming if I'm thinking about it and talking about it, it's coming. Um, but it's it's interesting how hard it is to to get a to get a hundred percent good. It's like when you go to the cafe now and your almond milk is suddenly not good. I'm like shit. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> so but, yeah. But the wool, you know, what what's great is that the wool is South African, and Renal for a very long time has invested in in very eco-friendly production methods. So she has her own carding machines and her own. She re recycles all the water that she uses to make the felt to grow vegetables for the guys who are working in the studio. And um, the the dyes were vegetable dyes. That's why there's so much variation in the in the in the orangutan's coloring because it was just dyed in that pot with vegetable dyes in batches. So that that the the two creatures are are a hundred percent eco-friendly the two the 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 um the orangutan and the polar bear and then the others are in varying degrees but still a very large percentage um of eco-friendly production methods I've seen your Instagram posts with, um, the orangutan, which is oh, really? <laughs> success the definition of success okay. oh that's that that's amazing oh. <laughs> Instagram success, the, the ultimate um, designator, <laughs> for sure. Are there any more questions? Please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, no. We were approached yesterday for Shanghai. So I mean, that's an example, and that was in the first few hours. So I think people understand the excitement that it creates and the positive way that it sort of gets you to learn. I mean, I spoke to some people, I get, 
I mean, I get a bit hectic and I get a bit scared. I go, uh oh, I've like really depressed this guy. And then they will hug me and go, you've touched me, thank you so much. You know, so you've got to get that door open in the right way. But we're going to go from here, we, we, we will go to Miami, and then we will go to LA. So we will do the traveling, and I mean, the more and more I can stop using, I'm big about vernacular, whereas now I can't sort of bring stuff from Africa to here. That's sort of, I mean, we had to do it to start the project. But what I want to do is start working with local people in local areas, and we do the exhibitions there. So we start working with their animals, their techniques, their materiality, and start bringing the message there too, as opposed to someone trying to throw the stones out of Africa. You know? We will. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Guys, I think that we don't have any more time. I can see everybody lining up over at, at Basel, which means the first choice is about to open, and it <laughs> means that we've been talking for an hour. I wanted to leave us. I want to thank all of you, because it's been really fantastic to talk to you guys. And I think we have one more video. We live in a world of stories. Now, a story can be fact, or it can be fiction. But sometimes, even when the facts are overwhelmingly clear, some people choose not to believe them. What do you believe? There's no doubt that pieces of the natural world could survive if humanity pushes our planet to the brink. But it is not a world that you and I are familiar with. If we do nothing, the picture of the world is one of absolute devastation. Super storms all the time. Heat waves that kill thousands. There's not access to clean water. There isn't access to food. Climate change is deeply connected to the destruction of our ecosystems on land and sea. Species extinction, habitat loss, these are not just things, well, we can lose a little of this, a little of that. Acidification, pollution, overfishing, literally strip mining the ocean. We live inside of a living system. If something uh, puts that system in peril, you are in peril. It's not always political issues which makes political crisis. In many cases, these crises happen because of environmental issues. Most of humanity lives on the coasts. You're headed toward a world where that's going to become dangerous. You have a refugee crisis as people start moving away from where they've been for generations. A world that is warmer has more war. All of this can seem incredibly overwhelming. But the truth is, the only way not to feel hopeless is simply to take action. But what do we do? How do we solve a problem that is so massive, so complex, and is always changing? In order to tackle this issue, we can't just solve one thing. We've got to solve them all, simultaneously. And it's important to look at the best teacher, nature. Nature is never still, it is always changing. The key with LDF was to build an organization that was dynamic, nimble, and most importantly, one that responded to nature's most urgent threats because less than 3% of all philanthropic giving goes towards protecting our planet, we knew we had to do something now. And instead of trying to do it all ourselves, LDF is focused on getting support and resources out to the most effective organizations on the ground. To date, we're proud to have given over $80 million in grants to projects across six areas of focus. For example, there's Amazon Frontlines and the Sabo Alliance, a project in the Western Amazon. For decades, industrial-scale deforestation 
mining, agriculture, and oil production has threatened the lives of the indigenous people. With support from LDF, Amazon Frontline's Nasebo Alliance are providing clean energy and water solutions, as well as empowering the local communities to map and protect their ancestral lands. Leo's foundation understands the scale of the threats. They've raised significant resources dedicated to protecting our planet's last wild places. In our oceans, the National Geographic Society's pristine seas has been conducting expeditions to help form marine protected areas. LDF helps fund their scientific studies of these ecosystems, which show us the benefits of protecting them. As of today, 17 of the 23 places they've studied have been protected. This is where Leonardo DiCaprio and his foundation are so important. We need to inspire people to contribute to the largest ocean conservation legacy in history. Or look at the Solutions Project, a leading voice in renewable energy. In 2014, they proved that a world of wind and solar energy is entirely possible. Now, with support from LDF, they're investing in communities and leaders on the front lines of transitioning. The great thing about the Solutions Project is it is so audacious. 100% sustainable when it comes to energy, period. Well, sometimes you have to raise the bar that high to get people's imagination going. This is just a small example of the over 200 projects that we've been honored to support at LDF. Each one has their own unique story. And together, we can write a new story and a new vision for the future. A future where the natural world and humanity coexist in harmony. But in order to get there, we need to drastically change the way we live on this planet. Citizen action, people being involved, accountability and activism within the political process. This is not a losing proposition if we do the things that we know we can do and that we have the technology to do now. You know, it's human nature to go to sleep, not pay attention, and it's human nature to wake up too and to realize that we can be better, we have to be better, and then to start being better. We are living in a very small planet Earth. The national boundaries do not have many meaning. It's a matter of solidarity of our society. We have to work together. Anyone who thinks that they can't make a difference is wrong future is living in harmony with nature instead of the way modern humans seem to live in competition with it. Everyone has a role to play. Right now is this incredible window of time where we have not just an obligation, but really a call to action to get the entire planet and all of society globally on board with transitioning to a new way of existing. You can't hurt the planet without hurting people, too. So, forcing the issue now, while there's still some time, is doing a tremendous service to humanity. Everybody recognizes this responsibility. We don't own the planet, we borrow the planet, we pass it on to future generations. And the truth is, we have not fully lived up to that responsibility yet, but we can. This is our story, and ultimately, we are the ones writing it. We have to realize that. This isn't fiction, it's our future. We can all have an impact, but we have to work together to protect our only home. If I could just leave everybody with one thought, in the hour that we've been sitting here, six plant or animal species went extinct.
That's 1,000 times the natural rate of extinction. And so I want to offer a challenge to Porky, an artistic challenge, because at the trajectory that we're going with all of these species upon which we depend, as you just saw, humans will be on that list of extinction. So what do you think, Porky? Can you do one in the endangered series that's human? <laughs> all right, you've heard it. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Porky, did you have one last thing you wanted to say? Uh, it's just a finished thought to say. That was such a good thought. It's like, come back to mine. It's stupid. Uh, <laughs> Buckminster Fuller is one of my biggest inspirations in life. And Buckminster Fuller was, was upset that we were calling it planet Earth because the planet means it can be there forever, no matter what happens. So he changed it to spaceship Earth. So every single person on Earth has their job to do. And if you don't do it, it's going down. <laughs> I also just want to say thank you to my boss, Leonardo DiCaprio, for putting all his power and celebrity into doing something like this and to opening my eyes and I hope everybody else's eyes here. Here, here. Thank you.